All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this edition of Monday Morning Human Intelligence. So 30 minutes to shake up your brain and get your week started off right. So it's great seeing everyone uh, joining up. So um, if you, I'd invite you to turn on your video if you're willing to do that, being able to see other humans and talk to people rather than speaking to the abyss. It's a key uh, element of human connection. So we'd love to be able to see you on this, uh, on this morning. We also, we've got the chat going. So any questions or comments or suggestions or um, just observations that you have, we'd love to see those in the chat um, as well. So feel free to put those in. If you want to connect with folks, put your LinkedIn address there as well. And it's been a great way to get folks uh, connected along the way. We've got Dean Myers with us again this week doing the graphic recording. So you can spotlight uh, his, uh, his work to sort of see how that's progressing as we go along. And we have another great guest uh, with us. So Rebecca, thanks for all your help. We'd love to uh, get a quick introduction about Jordan, please. Yes, thank you for joining us, everybody. Good to see you all. So Jordan is a marketing manager and a defense change maker who has passion and experience cutting through bureaucracy. And she's learned what it is to be the golden middle between peers and potential partners. Thank you for being here, Jordan. So excited. I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Dan and Rebecca. Oh, thank you. Also for for Jordan, we'll put up the uh, the disclaimer because Jordan is still um, active duty in the Air Force, so her opinions that she expresses today are hers alone and not necessarily representative of the United States Air Force, the U.S. government, or AFWERX. So great. So here's what we're going to talk about uh, today. We're going to talk about the golden middle. So you hear a lot about the uh, the frozen middle, but we're going to really talk about it in a, in a different way. We're going to talk about the golden middle here. And the tradition of the golden middle goes back to Buddhism. So you know, creativity is all about taking elements from other, um, other domains and sort of applying them in, in different ways. So this is one that I thought was pretty interesting, where essentially part of Buddhist philosophy is that we exist in a world between extremes and sort of the path to Nirvana is managing those two extremes. On one extreme, you have a, a vice and you have sort of the opposite of that also as a vice on the other extreme. And the middle path of the golden way is finding the place in between those two extremes. You see the same type of philosophy uh, reflected in Aristotle as well. He talks about the golden mean, where you have the, the same idea that you're trying to live this life between two extremes and that's where you find, where you find virtue. But you also see it in Thomas Kuhn and his um, writings about scientific revolutions and the way that science evolves. And he talks about scientists living in this world where they have to be committed to the tradition of science and scientific principles. But then in order to make any, any change, they have to sort of follow their own path and decide what is, uh, what is new and what is different. And I think one thing that's interesting to explore, and I'm looking forward to exploring it with Jordan today, is sort of the this world that that she lives in and operates in and excels in is sort of in between these two extremes. So here are a few extremes for you to consider as we talk about innovation and organizational change, right? That there's some golden middle between adherence to tradition and um, essentially deviation, right? And for those that are interested in national security, the you know, tradition is deeply rooted into, into the military and the things that we uh, that we do, but we also are, uh, we're aware that those traditions are not going to be the things that serve us uh, well into the future. At the same time, if you look at the other extreme and you have constant deviation, you're never really able to form a coherent uh, team that's able to move forward. So you have to find sort of the virtue in between those two. Another example, also very applicable to national security is sort of this uh, golden middle between hierarchy and individualism, right? So the uh, on one end, you have a military that's um, where hierarchy is is essentially everything, right? I mean, we literally wear our positions on our on our clothes. We, we wear the same clothes. People tell us, you know, what, what clothes to wear. But we're at a time where the Air Force in particular is looking for innovation and looking for people who are having these more um, individualistic uh, ideas, and they're looking to um, think in different ways. But if you had everyone thinking in a completely different way, you don't have, again, a very coherent team that's able to move forward. So how do you find that golden middle between those two? Same thing between consensus and discord, right? You want people to essentially agree and to um, 
follow a certain path, but if everyone's agreeing, then you're only getting essentially one of the answers. On the other end, you have Discord where nobody agrees and you're not able to get anything good working there. And here's where the last one I'll talk about is uh, recklessness and security. If you want innovation, you have to find the golden middle between taking um, these, uh, these risks and the chances that are essentially reckless to the mission you're trying to achieve. Um, but at the same time, if you were um, overly secure, right? If you're overly interested in um, abolishing all risks, you're not gonna get to that place in between. So what I'd like is to ask you in the chat. So here's just your know, four quick examples of sort of two vices and looking to find the virtue between those. But as you look at your own organizations, the own your own teams that you're a part of, what do you see as sort of the most challenging tension in your organization? And if you could just you know, put that in the chat, um, whether it's related to um, just general personnel issues or if it's related to innovation or it's related to um, adapting to the world we live in, what's the sort of the dialectic that you are seeing there? Yeah, so uh, Nick Swain talking about tradition versus innovation, comfort versus uncertainty of change, absolutely. Good. Culture defined by platform and units versus culture defined by the operational environment, that's great. So uh, Mike mentions balancing the need of multiple stakeholders, right? Different people will have a different middle all along the way. Uh, Jess is talking about management in general. Cedric's talking about a willingness to fix problems until they go public, right? So a willingness to be out ahead, but not to be too far ahead. Management versus leadership. Rebecca's got, uh, they're talking about tradition and innovation. Right, new, embracing new technology and data mining. That's great. And Bruce, the speed of decision-making versus risk-taking. Great. So, so Jordan, this is uh, sort of, um, your your area and your space where you uh, where you work in the Air Force. So I'm curious uh, for you, um, like what is what do you see from from your perspective about these sort of tensions that uh, that exist, and what do you see as the biggest challenges to um, to innovation in the Air Force? Absolutely. So I joined AFWERX about a year and a half ago, and I came straight off of active duty over to to AFWERX uh, through the Air National Guard, and I remember. Go, coming into this like new environment where we didn't wear uniforms, we, we call everybody by our first names, we don't use rank, um, we have all this freedom to do a lot of new things and I use that like as soon as I got over I was like oh I'm just going to throw all the rules out, out the window right like everything in the bureaucracy was wrong and that's not something that I want to be part of. And it took me a while to realize that there, there are certain things that are in place for a reason and there are certain rules and, and things that that like really do help the organization. And then there are other things where we're trying to push the limit and we're trying to improve. But what I found is that a lot of people in the innovation space think similarly where they just want to demonize a lot of the way that things are and they just want to kind of push past that and ignore, ignore the situation. And what that ends up doing is it creates that tension, I think, between the people that we, we regularly call the, the frozen middle and then the innovators and the people who are doing things really differently. And so what, what ends up happening is oftentimes, even, even at AFWERX, is we're, we're hopping on calls with different people, trying to mend relationships and trying to help people understand what we're doing. But oftentimes the, the new initiative that was created or a resource was maybe designed for people who aren't completely on board with it yet. So we go back and forth between the, we gotta go fast, we gotta do this thing when you're asking people or, or you're trying to tell people to jump on board when they're not ready for it. And so that's something that we've, we've constantly gone back and forth on and I've been involved in because I'm somebody who really focuses on empathy and really focusing on building those relationships and getting feedback from people who, who are expected to use these tools. And so that's just something that I've, I've had a lot of experience in now, and I've gotten to see the cert certain things that really do help people kind of um, open their eyes to it or, or be more open to things, or on the innovation side, help people understand that there, there are certain things in place for a reason, or at least that you should listen to the people who have been doing things for a really long time so that they feel like, like their input is valued and you're not just telling them to get on board without even hearing what they have to say. So oh. some of those things, oh yeah. Good. No, 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 please. No. So, so all that's um, great. You've got lots of, uh, lots of pieces in there that I'd like to, um, 
like to pull out one of the things that you said, and I use this term as well, was the uh, the the frozen middle. Um, and uh, I agree with with Mike that it's not it's not helpful to uh, to label a group of people as something that's not the type of uh, behavior that inspires change. But when you when you hear people that you talk to talk about the frozen middle, sort of what do they um, what do they have in mind? Like what is the stereotype that they are uh, perpetuating there? So usually, <clears throat> and yeah, I, I I also agree. Like it's not good to just put put people in that in that bucket and then they can't change. But I do find that in the innovation space, a lot of people do do think that way, and they go they go they directly look at the people like uh, who are saying no to an initiative where maybe we're we're trying to implement a new solution in acquisitions or in uh, in a personnel like center and we're trying to implement this new thing it's the people who are standing up saying no that's not allowed or we haven't done it or here's this this specific regulation that says like we're, we're not going to be able to do it that way and they're the ones who are constantly coming up with with other uh or, or certain things that prevent you from being able to move forward and and that kind of like creates some tension there um, but a lot of times what, what they are referring to has some reasoning behind it and they just haven't had the opportunity to to discuss and hear hear the perspectives from from the other side and figure out what what uh, what you can do to move forward and what what success even looks like for for the organization right. if you were to to find a way around it I think that's uh, I think that's exactly exactly right right we and it's exactly the type of extremes that we're talking about there is you know, one extreme, which is a vice where you have this, um, this militant adherence to policies and procedures and the way that we've always done things. On the other side, you have a um, almost militant innovation where nothing that we've done in the past is good and we must do everything different now. And I think what you try to find is that place in the middle. So I'm, I'm curious about your place sort of in the middle of that conversation as you talk to the people who are um, who are invested in the status quo and those people who are being incentivized to change the status quo like how do you how do you work the communication between sort of those two groups of folks yeah so one of the best things to do is just make time for discussions and for the the opportunity for dialogue so one of the things that i find a lot of people don't even try to do is just set up a call or set up a meeting where you're actually talking with with somebody and hearing their perspective and, and just having having that discussion so one of the things i i regularly try and do is either set up those calls for people or or make a point to join them and i kind of tend to play the mediator or somebody who i will i will express understanding of both sides of the discussion and sometimes be, being in the innovation world, when I join those calls, everybody on my team expects me to just be, a, be on their side, right? And just somebody who's like, like trying to convince this other person on the call that they need to get on board with, with this thing that we're doing. And what I end up doing is really listening to that other person and, and trying to figure out what, what the reasoning is. And sometimes it's a lot more nuanced and like has really good reasoning that, that the people on the innovation side won't necessarily like latch onto, they just think it's that, that, that pushback, that frozen middle of just saying no. But if you listen, if you really listen, then you, you can see that, well, maybe this program was never supposed to like create this thing, or maybe it was never really solving a, a problem in the first place. And it's just, it's that back and forth of like, are we actually trying to understand each other or just trying to get somebody to jump onto our solution and run with it? So Yeah, that, that's great. I'm going to go to Rebecca for a question in a second, but I'm not going to pass up the opportunity to um, to acknowledge that the way to innovation, what it sounds like you're saying, is through actually talking to people, collaborating with people, and uh, mm -hmm. working with people. So Ryan has a great, uh, great tip there. Um, beginning conversations would help me to understand. We talk a lot about um, having the your questions begin with, I, I, I'm curious, and then genuinely listening, right? Listening to understand rather than listening to to respond. And that is uh, over and over in the things that we teach. That ends up being like the the golden middle, right? Is working between people who are trying to do something good and then just helping them to to do that and collaborating in a, in a safe, psychologically safe and, and open way. And that's really the path. So uh, Rebecca, I'd love to uh, love to come to you and see what kind of questions you have. Yeah. So I really needed this right now. This is perfect. <laughs> I, I, I try to be very conscious and in being in the golden middle myself and Ryan, the, the point you made very relevant to me right now. Um, so Jordan, I'd be curious to know what your biggest challenges are and the biggest rewards being in the golden middle. 
I'll start with challenges. So for challenges, I'd say most of it is just <laughs> more trying to com communicate with the innovation side oftentimes than, than the side of the people in the, on the operational side of the organization who are trying to understand things because um, you, a lot of those people that they're incredibly smart, they're, they're incredibly forward thinking, they're doing incredible work and they are making a lot of change. And so oftentimes that leads to a lot of overconfidence or, or the frustration with people who just aren't getting like, like getting with the program or not, not understanding what they're doing. So it's trying to talk to them and provide them with feedback without uh, kind of turning them away from, from having those discussions at all. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges I face is just, just reminding them that you need to approach people with empathy and with, with compassion um, when, when they're pushing back against a new, a new initiative. And then I think the biggest rewards is, is on, on the flip side is when you finally get them to approach people in, in that kind of way and have somebody on the operational side of the Air Force, in my case, who, who starts to get it. And we've, we've provided them with the kind of information that they desire or that they need in order to understand what we're doing. So maybe it's a specific success story and that, that finally, finally clicks with somebody who is pushing back against, against this, this new initiative. And um, they're, they're like, oh, I, I get it now. Like finally I understand what, what's happening. Even though I was really against it, I had all these reasons for being against it. But once I saw it take, take hold in, in this way that really changed somebody's life or changed somebody's work, then now I understand what you're trying to do here. But up until that point, if, if you're just talking about this thing very vaguely and you're just trying to say, oh, well, just, just hop on board, well, that's not really going to work. So it's, it's once somebody gets it and once it clicks that I think it really is, is the most rewarding thing. And it, it sounds like you're building trust when you do that. Absolutely. Which, which is the rewarding part, I can assume, that relationship building. Definitely. And it's just proof that that. All these, all these innovation efforts and modernization efforts will, I think, work, and they are working um, over over time. Is just when people really focus on on connection, and and yeah, bu building that trust between different people who seem like they're in very very different worlds, and that they don't really have anything to do with each other. Or, yeah. No, that, that's great. Now, I would like to uh, go to Chris in just a second if he can expand on a comment that he put there in the chat. I want to make sure that we uh, that we understand that. But but I think. Also, part of what you're saying is that there's this belief that finding that middle is about compromise, right? That people have to sort of give up the um, pieces of the things they believe in in order to come to that golden middle. And I think when you like get down to the end and there is some like actual negotiation about um, you know, which pieces of this uh, process are we going to implement or which pieces of this new thing we're going to implement. But I think well before that, it's not about compromise. It's about understanding. And that as you start establishing that common understanding and you have the collaboration between those two extremes, that people working in a psychologically safe environment tend to come closer to that middle, right? Their extreme views tend to be buffered by understanding the other person's side, and then you start to get a lot closer there. So Chris, are you willing to uh, expand on your, your comment there as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Cause I think it's something that Jordan does so well. We've actually talked about it, you know, in, uh, in other circles too. Um, I don't think you can come in a lot of times and, and say, for example, the frozen middle, it's been a really relevant topic by the past year. I've heard about it quite a bit and say it doesn't exist because once you do that, you're shutting off an entire side of the conversation for, for a lot of people. Um, and especially approaching it from the innovation side, which is where Jordan sits, you have to be able to understand that. So as much as she's the golden middle, which I would totally agree with, she's also helping thaw that frozen middle, which is, you know, just to add a metaphor on top of a metaphor. But um, no, I think, I think that's what I'm getting at is you have to be careful when you're on one side of the fence to come in and just voice your opinion as if it's the ultimate, you know, authority or we're doing the greatest thing, so do it, like she said. Um, you have to be really willing to accept and empathize with where somebody might be, right? And if you can do that, that you can really start to follow what's around them, I think. No, that's great. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. I'd love to uh, hear from uh, Jordan, and then we'll go to uh, Mike, who has his hand raised as well. Yeah, so so one of the things that I found, um, and maybe, I don't know if this is just a military term, but uh, good idea fairies. I don't know if you guys have all heard that, but one of the things I found is 
people think that in, people in the innovation space are just good idea fairies, and they're just throwing out ideas, and, and a lot of people went on the operational side, when they think that they're innovating, it's just a lot of people becoming more comfortable with the idea of just throwing out ideas and trying them. And so one of the things that um, I'd be, be involved with, like Daniel Halter's Agitare initiative and, and everything around like facilitation and design thinking, one of the things that I've started to recognize is that we don't make time for both the, the time for diverging and converging on an, on an initiative. And so, so one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to help teach people as well is that there, there's a time for just throwing out ideas and, and just kind of thinking larger than life and really expanding what, what's within the realm of possible. And then there's a time for coming up with specific solutions or pathways forward that are based off of your strategy. And because, because of that, once you identify that there are two, then people start to understand, oh, well, you, you can do both. You just have to do them separately and deliberately. But if you try to, try to do them all at once, then you're going to get the good idea fairies or you're going to get the, the naysayers, the people who are saying no to everything. So no, it's, it's kind of yeah, like focusing a, on those two, two different things. <laughs> that's exactly right. And that's uh, the paper I was reading from, uh, from Thomas Kuhn. He talked about that in science as well, that science that most of the textbooks at his time were written to be very convergent, right? It's telling people like here are the rules and what they needed was more divergent thinking. But you have to find the middle between the two of those. If you have all divergent thinking, you never get to, to actually implementing anything and making it work. So I'd love to go to, uh, go to Mike and see what, uh, what you have to say. Please, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Hey, I just want to expand on a little perspective about this this idea of the frozen middle, and, and I'll go back to my early comment. You know, you know what I found in my time in in the Air Force is, uh, while in some audiences that was a useful label, um, generally speaking, I found it to be unhelpful overall to the conversation. And I think to Chris's point, a little bit because what's going what's going on in my experience is that uh, people have different levels of risk that they're willing to take, right? So oftentimes at the senior level of an organization, uh, they're very conscious about willing, willingness to accept some risk, knowing that there might be failure, um, partly because they're at a position where they're not necessarily looking to move up a ladder, partly because their goals, the organization, they know if we don't take some risk, we won't get to where we're going. And then at the junior level of an organization, um, folks are just generally willing to take more risk, you know, just young teenager, they're not obviously teenagers in an organization, but if you just think about that mentality and they wanna see change, they know things can be better. And, and in the middle of an organization, you have people who are balancing uh, failure and not wanting to necessarily find failures or maybe trying to navigate their way in the position, way up the organization. And as uh, Jordan said, they also, because of their experience, see some, some things that maybe the younger folks might not see and because of their depth of understanding of the problem, see some things the senior folks might not see because, because they're in the middle and they're typically deeper in the details. So that what I found the secret is how can you get the folks in this middle part of the organization to be more comfortable accepting the risk, right? So if, on the, if you're working from the bottom up, you need to think through that and go, what risks might they be taking and how can I help them mitigate that risk? And if you're working from the top down, you need to be thinking about the same thing. How can I take this feeling of they're accepting more risk than they think is prudent off their shoulders, either by saying, hey, I'm gonna own this risk. You know, I'll, cut, I'll, I'll do the top cover. If this thing is an epic failure, I will own it. But, but from both the top and the bottom, I think the key to unmelting that frozen middle, which is a term, you know, I, I don't use actually, you know, in except in an academic situation um, is I think trying to melt the risk that the people in the middle are seeing. Great. Some right. food no, for thought. No, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and I think you, you draw a good point, right? So what is sort of the other extreme of, if, if you consider one extreme to be what we've been calling the frozen middle, like what is the other extreme? And maybe it's the the fiery middle, right? It's the middle that doesn't listen to anything that's you know coming from above, and maybe doesn't care about what's happening below either. So you don't get anything done that um, in in that conception um, as well. So I'd love to hear from you, Jordan. So when you talk to people, um, how does how does risk come up in the in the conversation? And what are your perceptions about the way folks see it, either willingness to take risk or uh, being uh, risk seeking? 
Yeah, so I think with, with every organization, it's going to be a little different based off of like the different incentives or, or performance requirements and, and all that. So I think with, with the Air Force in particular, I've seen that there's, there's been an increase in the willingness to take risk, but that's mostly because Air Force senior leaders put in place like a squadron innovation fund where they have some extra money set aside specifically to test out these, these new initiatives and just try, try out different experiments and that, that money isn't being tracked. They're not having to show the performance requirements and they're not having to do that, which has resulted in a lot of people using, using that money to try things out and commanders are okay with it. But then that, that also, I think, in some ways can take away from, from the focus on, well, how do you measure these innovation initiatives and how, how do you actually keep track of if, if they are impactful and how you, how you figure out what, what does risk taking look like if that fund didn't exist and, and where else can you, can you put that money? So um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of different opportunities there. But um, we, we are seeing a lot, of, a lot of changes, but I think that's just because uh, among like leadership levels, there's just more dialogue about what it means to take risk and just they'll, they'll visit these, these innovation hubs, they'll visit AFWorks, they'll, they'll talk with other people and figure out what, what everybody else is doing. So I think it's by us, us socializing the different, the different projects that have been successful or have failed. As, as a marketing person, I, I have that opportunity to also share like the, the stories where things haven't gone as great and just talk about how that's okay. I think, I think that that's normalizing it a little bit more, um, but at some point, I think it'll have to be institutionalized uh, where, where in, in performance reports and who gets promoted and all that is based off of um, those who are willing to take a certain amount of risk. Um, and yeah. So, so we have just about uh, about three and a half minutes. We like to always have something that's uh, that's very practical for folks on on these calls. Something people can put into put into action uh, this week. So, um, I would love to hear hear something from you. Whether it's about talking to to people and building that empathy, or it's from your marketing um, hat, where you uh, maybe you talk about failure, or you find that golden middle in communicating uh, a a true story that lies between theater and uh, outstanding success. Sure. Yeah. So. Um... Definitely, definitely creating space for, for those conversations. So making a point to talk to people who disagree with you or disagree with what your organization is doing and getting feedback and then providing that feedback to other people within your organization um, if you're on the innovation side. Um, also, another thing that I found pretty useful is when a new idea comes to me inside my organization before jumping on board and being really excited, excited about it is I try and figure out what, what problem it's really solving. And for marketing, that's extremely important because I don't want to just go off selling this new initiative or this new project and it not actually solve a problem or it causes more problems. So that's something uh, to, to keep in mind too. Take, take some practice <laughs> to know what questions to ask and figure out how to, how to communicate with people. But that, that's another good thing to do. And then also just learn to be really comfortable uh, siding with, with a, a few different people from different places. You, you never really know who you're going to engage with and you're going to um, agree with them or disagree with them. So just be comfortable kind of kind of playing the field in that sense. Um, and then just, yeah, create, uh, yeah, create space for that divergent and convergent thinking as well. So you're not just coming up with ideas all over the place and you're not actually applying it to a strategy. So thank you for a quick summary of about 15 things we can all do today to, uh, to oh, be yeah. better. <laughs> the, the ones that uh, particularly resonate with me are uh, like, what are we trying to do around here? Like, what is the actual goal of, of this process and what problem are we, are we trying to solve? As well as about asking uh, questions. And we do have a, an article on our, on our blog. It's uh, the question you ask determines the answer you get. So it's sort of a guide to um, asking the right questions. You can actually get to what you're trying to, uh, to figure out. So I'd love to go to uh, Rebecca. We have just, just over a minute left to uh, get any comments. You've got tons of great stuff in the chat there, as well as if you can give us a look forward to uh, what's coming up next week. Guys, there's just so much to talk about here. Can we just extend this for another 30 minutes? Um, <laughs> no, I'll be quick. Um, so, so next week, we actually have Christina Cow. I, I believe I'm saying her last name correctly. And we are going to be discussing, discussing the uh, unconscious or subconscious form of thinking um, and more of like a like meditative type of um, talk. So it's a, little, it's a little different from what we're used to having, but we'll make sure it's very human intelligence focused. So you guys got to tune in for that. Thanks for Great. being here. Oh, thank you. 
Yes, so, we, uh, so we'll go take a look at, uh, at Dean's uh, work in a second. So we'd love to see you um, in, our, in our Slack channels. If you have not uh, been invited there, send me a note and we'll make sure we get you invited to Slack so you can continue the conversation. Um, thank you so much for being here with us uh, today, Jordan. This is a great conversation and thank you for all that you do for all of us here as well as uh, in the Air Force. And then we'll just Thanks go, thank you. And then we'll spotlight uh, Dean's work here as we sign off in the last four seconds. So thanks for being with us. We look forward to seeing you next week. All right, see you.